Aloha class. We talked so far about kidneys and how they function and osmoregulation in general, but we haven't talked really about um, animals that have special osmotic challenges. Like, for example, um, what happens when you live with only salt water available? Uh, we also haven't talked about regulation, which we'll um, talk about at the end here. So this is a quote from the rhyme of the ancient mariner, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. And um, that refers to the challenges of having only f salt water as a source. So let's review again the challenges faced by animals in different environments. Freshwater aquatic organisms are constantly gaining water or they have to be water impermeable. Saltwater aquatic organisms can either drink seawater and excrete salt, or they can drink no seawater and obtain the water that they get from food that's less salty. Terrestrial organisms can either drink wa fresh water, or if they're marine, drink seawater and excrete salt, or if they have no water available, they can obtain their water from food. And that comes from the free water that's in food, like for example, food is maybe 75% water. And then the met metabolic water that they get from metabolism. Remember that um, a glucose molecule plus oxygen gets converted into CO2 plus water. So anytime that you metabolize food molecules, you can obtain water from that reaction. And then some animals can obtain water from condensation, and that would be mainly insects. So just to review, remember that seawater is very salty with a total osmolarity of about a thousand milliosmoles. And that is mostly sodium and chloride ions. Um, and then the other molecules are a minority contributor, but it's mostly s sodium chloride. So if you are a salt water, um, teal, uh, sorry, salt water shark, or a coelacanth, you tend to be a, a ureosmoconformer, which means that you have a pretty high internal osmolarity. So you have a higher salt, sodium and chloride concentration, but you also have a high urea concentration. And that brings you pretty close to the salinity of salt water, or the, sorry, the osmolarity of salt water. If you are a teleost fish, then you are not an osmoconformer, but you tend to be an osmoregulator. So you're not quite there, but you have some other mechanism to try to regulate against the high salinity of salt water. Freshwater organisms have a much lower um, extracellular fluid osmolarity. And um, it's not that different actually from terrestrial organisms. Okay, so for most things that are not marine, like for example, humans, drinking seawater therefore is a losing strategy because the problem is that your kidneys, even if you, you can concentrate your urine and you can concentrate your the salts in your urine, you can only concentrate so much. So if the maximum urine concentration that you can do is 2% salt, but seawater is in fact 3% salt, or actually 3.5% salt. Then if you drink seawater, the urine you produce is maximally at 2%. So in order to produce that urine, you're gonna be drawing water from your body and actually getting more dehydrated the more seawater that you bring, that you drink. So it's a losing proposition. So interestingly, there are many marine birds and marine reptiles, um, turtles, for example, uh, as well as marine iguanas and other, um, and sea snakes and other things. Um, and fish can drink seawater. And they can manage to obtain pure water from the seawater. And they have much less highly efficient kidneys than mammals. How do they do it? Well, they tend to have salt glands. So um, 
marine reptiles and birds so in birds they tend to be in the so sorry so they can drink seawater that's three percent and then they can produce a nasal fluid that's higher in salt concentration as well as a urine so without that salt gland they wouldn't be able to do this and the way that it's accomplished is through countercurrent multiplication. So in birds, the salt glands are in the head. Um, they tend to be super, super orbital. Um, in sea snakes, they're in the mouth. And in crocodiles, they're in the tongue. And um, in lizards, they're nasal. So anyway, it's pretty cool. And, um, but they function very similarly. And the way that they do it is through active transport of sodium and chloride. And then the salty secretion uh, drips down and eventually gets excreted, typically out the nose. Okay. So how is that regulated? Well, um, it's actually monitored through the extracellular fluid volume as well as the extracellular fluid sodium concentration. It's not running all the time, remember, because it's energetically expensive. So when a bird drinks seawater, it's going to cause um, water to, to move from the extracellular fluid into the gut, reducing that volume. Um, and then causing the extracellular fluid to get more salty. And when it hits a threshold, that's when the stimulus for the salt gland operation kicks in, and then it starts to secrete the, the salty secretion. So it produces both a salty secretion, or salty snot, and pure water, which is the, the water source for the marine bird. Pretty cool, huh? So if a bird drinks 100 ml of seawater at 1,000 milliosmoles and produces a salty secretion that's at 1,200 milliosmoles, how much water does it gain? Well, it's basically all you have to do is keep track of the salt. So we have salt water, drink, drunk, and then it's going to get transformed into a salty secretion and pure water. So if we just track there's a hundred ml of salt water at a thousand milliosmolar concentration. And if we multiply the volume times the osmolarity, we can keep track of the salt. So that's going to result in an unknown volume of salty secretion times 1200 milliosmoles plus um, an unknown volume of pure water, but it's, it's got to be 100 minus X, right? times the osmolarity of pure water, which is zero. So that if you solve for X, you're going to get a, val a result of 83.3 ml of salty secretion. And therefore, um, the volume of pure water is going to be 16.7 ml. OK, so it's pretty straightforward. So desert mammals are kind of similar in the way because um, they definitely want to reduce water loss. Um, and they, they can concentrate water, but urine and feces does result in water loss. Um, you, can, you can, and there's not much water to be gained in the desert. <laughs> okay, so how did they do it? Well, um, they try to reduce water loss by remaining in the burrow during the day and then being more active at night so they can avoid the heat. They also use um, nasal countercurrent exchange to reduce respiratory evaporative water loss. They have um, very highly efficient kidneys, really high. I mean, they, they have the most extreme in terms of kidney efficiency. Um, they, they resorb water in their rectum and produce a feces that is super dry. And then they gain water 
from seeds. They they mostly eat seeds. There aren't a lot of succulent water sources available. So uh, seeds are already kind of dry, so that doesn't result in too much water. But then most of their water is really from metabolic water, from the um, catabolism of the foodstuffs. Okay, so about 90% of their gain is from metabolic water and 10% from free water, and they don't drink at all. So most of their losses are in evaporation and perspiration and they've greatly reduced the urine loss due to urine and sorry water loss due to urine and feces so other um okay yeah so don't forget that anytime an animal eats food um, there's going to be water produced by the metabolism of food so water food remember food has some percentage of water that's what's called loose water or free water in food but once the food is oxidized, you're going to get a certain amount of water, metabolic water produced from burning carbohydrates, from burning fats, and from burning proteins. So you can see that you get the most water benefit from fats. And so it's no shock that camels use um, use a big fat store in their back, the hump, in order to store water and survive in the desert. And speaking of which, what do they do? How do they survive in the desert? Well, they're really big, so they can't hide from the sun. They can't go in a burrow. Okay, so they have a really um, different mechanism. And actually, when camels are dehydrated, they actually allow their body temperature to, um, to go up. They don't regulate it as much. And so what that does, um, when they allow their body temperature to rise during the day, because they're hotter, they don't have as much respiratory evaporative water loss. So that's one strategy. Um, they also uh, store urea in their tissues so that they, they do not urinate. They just store the urea in the tissues, reducing the water loss. And then when they, when they are finally allowed to have water, they can drink an enormous amount of water. So they can drink about 80 liters in 10 minutes, <laughs> okay? So basically they're dehydration tolerant. They're, um, they store fat and then they store urea to minimize water loss. So you can see that it's quite different, the camel versus the ground squirrel. Um, the ground squirrel also can, f so it can hide, and then when it goes out, it can get hot, and then down, up and down, up and down. It's, it's much harder for small mammals to take this strategy of allowing their body temperature to go up, because of course, it, it can just go up too fast or too much. Okay, but, um, but anyway, this is a strategy available for, for larger animals. So um, the maximum concentration ability of the kidney, of course, is related to the length of the loop of Henle, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But you can see from this table that it is very much correlated with the osmotic challenges of the animal. So animals that are mesic that don't really have water limitation have a pretty modest urine concentrating ability and they really can't have a too highly concentrated urine relative to their blood plasma but animals that live in the desert can have very very highly concentrated urine and um, it's, it can be pretty impressive and they do tend to be smaller animals as well. Okay. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to say too that marine mammals have no salt glands. And so it's actually still not clear how they handle large salt loads. Um, yeah, that's still an open mystery. And so they, they're thought to use a strategy of water conservation 
And so the blowhole is thought to be a way to minimize respiratory evaporative water loss, and they have a lower metabolic rate. Um, you know, and there's times when they can go without drinking or eating, but uh, that's still really not clear. So it's wide open. Okay, so how do we control or regulate um, your uh, osmotic concentration in the urine? So it's mediated through hormones, okay? And so let's just go through really quick. So cell-to-cell -cell communication um, is mediated over long distances through the endocrine system. So endocrine signals originate in one place and then they produce a molecule and it's usually transported through the circulation to its target tissue, which is someplace far away from the originating cell. Um, this is in contrast to paracrine signaling, where the signal and target cells are close together, or autocrine, where it's the same cell producing the signal and the target. Okay, anyway, it's done through the hormonal system. And um, these are some of the major organs, the major endocrine organs, the pituitary, um, the hypothalamus, the thyroid, and the adrenal glands. So water and salt balance is controlled by ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and aldosterone. Okay, and they control the permeability of the collecting duct. Uh, so the final concentration of urea or the dilution of the urine, the diluteness of the urine is determined in the collecting duct. So as you know, the maximum concentration ability is determined by the length of the loop of Henle because it's produced by countercurrent multiplication and a longer countercurrent length will allow a bigger top to bottom osmotic gradient. And so that's, this number is determined directly by the length of the loop of Henle. But within that limit, um, within the maximum that a taxon can do, you can always make less concentrated urine, right? You can make very dilute urine if that's the situation, if the, if the animal wants to get rid of a lot of fluid. Um, so that's under hormonal control, and the hormones affect the permeability of the collecting duct. So um, the final concentration is determined by the transport of salts in the distal tubule here. Um, and this is also under hormonal control. And then also the collecting duct here is very permeable to water. So water moves in, um, or water moves from a very dilute urine into the interstitial fluid if it's at high concentration and if water is allowed to flow out. Okay, um, and what controls, oh, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll just say, so water can flow out and then also this lower part is also very permeable to urea. Okay, so what is controlling how much water can flow out? It's antidiuretic hormone, ADH, or otherwise known as vasopressin. And what it does is um, when it, oh, sometimes it's called arginine vasopressin. So when the hormone comes and binds, it causes the production of many aquaporins. Remember, those are the channel proteins that allow water to flow through freely. So ADH creates more aquaporins, which allow more pukas in the collecting duct and more water to go in and out freely. So when water can flow through freely, it can leave the collecting duct causing the urine to get much more concentrated because of course the interstitial fluid is salty and so water will want to leave the collecting duct and that's why it's called antidiuretic <laughs> okay 
Um, so uh, sodium chloride is about 90% of the osmotic activity of the extracellular fluid. And because water follows salts, salts determine the volume of the extracellular fluid. And in this way, extracellular fluid is linked to blood pressure. Um, are a salt and extracellular fluid and blood pressure. So blood pressure is an indicator of blood volume and the salt content of the body. And how is this regulated? Well, um, the macula densa cells detect a decrease in blood pressure or solute delivery to the distal tubule. When that happens, it re releases, um, they release renin. And renin causes a rise in angiotensin, one and then two. Um, and then eventually it produces aldosterone. Okay, and these, these hormones result in vasoconstriction. Okay, so that's going to contribute to increased blood pressure, um, a feeling of thirst, um, and then more, yeah, more vasopressin secretion. Um, and then aldosterone itself is, is going to promote sodium resorption. So we have two effects, two main effects here. We have vasoconstriction and sodium absorption, which are both going to contribute to increasing blood pressure. Um, so aldosterone induced, um, induces an increase in sodium resorption. Okay, so these are some of the ways that um, that uh, osmolic re regulation and excretion are regulated. So um, I hope that helps. Finally, in um, the last part of your homework where you're doing the design problem practice, there's a question that involves um, how much osmotic flux is occurring through the skin. So we have a duck standing in a pond, and um, we want to know how much water is lost or gained through the skin of the feet because it's standing in fresh water. Okay, so you're given a formula that's in withers, and it's a formula for water flux, which is proportional to osmotic permeability, which is this um, parameter here. And you can get the value for that number on uh, in the book, but it's uh, you multiply it by the surface area and then this funny thing here. So to help you understand what this is, um, you're going to have the, the numerator here, the ends refer to the moles of um, moles of something. So NS is moles of solute and O is outside. So this would be in the water. Okay, moles of solute, it's a ratio of the moles of solute to the moles of water in the outside or in the freshwater pond, <laughs> okay? The other ratio is the moles of solute inside, which is in the extracellular fluid because that's the largest fluid compartment. It's the ratio of moles of solute inside to the moles of water inside. Okay, so you're probably wondering, how do I figure that out? Okay, well, here's a hint. Remember, the molecular weight of water is 18 grams per mole, right? Because it's two oxygen and, and a hydrogen. Wait, wait, no, no, no. It's one oxygen and two hydrogens. <laughs> so it's 18. So you can use this to calculate the number of moles of water per liter to match the osmolarity of the solute, which is given in moles per liter. Okay, so if you put the ratio of moles of water per liter, um, oh sorry, the ratio of the moles per liter of solute over the moles of water per liter of water, that will give you moles over moles because the liters will cancel out. Okay, so it's just a simple arithmetic. The other thing um, 
that is really kind of weird is this, what is this P osmotic? Okay, so this osmotic permeability, it's in these weird units of microns per second. And I spent many, many hours staring at this thing. What the heck is this unit? Probably tens of hours staring at this thing. And then finally I realized, okay, what the heck is this osmotic permeability? Well, it's, um, if you think of it as microns cubed over microns squared per second, it makes more sense because, um, the numerator refers to a volume, so that's the volume of, say, water that's going across over a surface area. So volume to surface area per second. So that's like a water flux per unit surface area per second, which is a rate. Okay, so I hope that that makes more sense and that helps you solve that problem. Um, because it's it's not that hard. It's just kind of weird units that you have to deal with. Anyway, um, I hope that helps. Take care. Bye-bye.